I got the perfect introduction though, because just in time, guess what uh, the postman brought me yesterday? No, no shit. Uh. Really. This is your new book that just came out, uh, yep. The Medieval and Renaissance Buckler. Now, as I told you, the first question that probably many of us will have, because I guess a lot of people in the audience already know you and your books. And so some might remember that you published the book of the buckler in 2015. So the first question that came up in my mind was, um, what's, what's new? Why a second book on the same topic? Uh, well, it's a very good question, actually. Um, first of all, of course, because there is more content now, because I have more knowledge, I have uh, better data. Um, I have more bits and pieces on the history and so on and so forth that it would be a shame if it wouldn't get out. Uh, and of course, because I have a lot more bucklers that I measured in the past. So I really wanted to, to publish them as well. And then I got in contact with Rolf Warming uh, and he agreed to write the part on the Scandinavian shields and bucklers, which of course is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so it basically it's a book along the same lines, but it's so much more than the book of the buckler. We get more information, more content, and that's and more chapters. That's definitely the new book is a larger format than the last one, mm -hmm. uh, and while the, the smaller, older one uh, clocked in at around two hundred and fifty pages, something like that. The new one is four hundred and forty-eight pages with with almost double the size. So that alone gives you an idea of the amount of content that is coming up. I first had a few questions on the buckler in general, and then I wanted to switch to uh, our main field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, I mean, uh, our channel is obviously mainly about 16th century Italian stuff, Hema stuff. So obviously I'm, I'll have to ask you some questions about that. Most of us, when we think about bucklers, especially the Hemaists, they have this medieval picture and context of the buckler. How old was the oldest buckler that you came across? Well, the oldest extant buckler, the oldest buckler that, that uh, could be handled, so to speak, um, is uh, one in the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo, in Norway, uh, the scene 9982. And unfortunately, it's only a fragment, but it's dated to around 1050 to 1150. So we were talking about uh, the 11th century. And it is rather on the larger size, so approximately 43 centimeters in diameter. Um, but that's, that's about the oldest buckler I'm aware of that is still around. I think bucklers are much older than most of us expect. <laughs> Definitely. They, they have always been around. We, we, we can date them back to antiquity with quite, quite um, a big assurance of it, quite, quite a s small margin of error. So definitely in the, in the classical antiquity, so Greek and, and uh, antique Romans, but even before them, the Assyrians and so on and so forth. And, uh, the Romans uh, often quoted bucklers they came across in fighting the Celts, especially the Celt Iberians, uh, but also Franco Celts, uh, and they themselves used it. So you could easily say at least 2000 years old, at least in Europe. In Europe, and I imagine also in other parts of the world. Okay. Basically, wherever people were, they invented the buckler because it's not such a huge concept. It's a small shield with a handle at the back. <laughs> um, so wherever people were, they, they invented the buckler, being in, in South America or in Polynesia or in, in African, basically all African cultures, mm -hmm. uh, Europe as well, Asia. Where people were, the buckler was invented. So the only continent you don't find it is Antarctica. Let's assume I, I don't know, I make a journey through Italy. If I find an original buckler, what would I find in terms of, or typically find if it's a 16th century buckler in terms of material, maybe also shape? It's quite interesting actually, um, because 16th century Northern Italy um, was at this time in terms of buckler having sort of a, of a two-way culture, I, I could almost say, because Either you would find a typically round buckler of type 1A, so flat mm -hmm. uh, and full metal, uh, only metal construction, or you would find a buckler that is square, the, the targa as, as, as you call it, I guess, um, which would be either of type 2A, so it's also flat, yeah. and they were usually made out of wood with a covering of parchment on the front and leather or any other skin product on the back. Mm -hmm. Or you would find the wave-like 2D buckler, 
square or Zeratarga, which is usually an all metal construction. Interestingly, uh, the two favorite types that you find in 16th century Italy is the round one, the 1A, and uh, the metal 2D, the wave like buckler. And they both sport the same um, pairing elements. So you both have these, these pairing bars with the round one as well with the, with the square one, and you have the same amount of pairing bars. Uh, and both of these bucklers also sport the hook, which is quite interesting. Uh, because hooks are almost omnipresent in the in the type two, the square type of bucklers, uh, not so much in the round bucklers, but all bucklers in Italy in the 16th century have a hook. Even if they don't have parrying bars, there is always a hook there. Um, okay. Your next question would be why? I have no idea why. <laughs> um, so far, I was unable to find any reference in in original materials as to why the, or how this hook was used. So. Um, not in, in illustrations, not in fencing treatises, of course, uh, but also not in, in stories and so on and so forth. So there is, it's definitely there. It has to be there for this um, type of, of uh, buckler in this area and time. But I have no idea why, why it was so important, obviously. By yeah. whom and when were bucklers used at all? <sighs> what context? Good question. Uh, basically everywhere and by everybody. Um, I think we rarely have uh, a weapon that was so in use through all strata of, of um, society as the buckler. It was used by noblemen, it was used by footmen, it was used by brawlers, it was used by criminals, it was used by soldiers. Um, so we have pretty much evidence of, of all sorts of, of um, situations where the buckler has been in use from the battlefield to um, household items where, where people are entering a house and, and someone grabs the buckler to defend themselves or people taking the buckler with them if they want to break into a house, for example, a beautiful uh, illustration in a, a version of a Decamarone where this is shown. Um, you have it, people traveling, taking the buckler with them as, as a piece of personal defense equipment. I would say it was, it was pretty much everywhere probably least of all on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I think by that time, the battle on the battlefield was, was not prominent anymore as it would have been uh, 100 or 200 years before. In general, uh, if, if I would ask you about uh, main differences between bucklers in Italy and elsewhere during that period of time, what would you say? Is, um, is there any difference at all or is it the same everywhere in Europe? Well, the round bucklers are basically the same everywhere, mm -hmm. um, with the addition of the hook and the pairing bars, which seem to be um, quite a must-have in, in northern Italy. Uh, the square bucklers are typically Italian. You find them very rarely outside of, of Italy. But I do have to admit, if a square buckler pops up anywhere in Europe, it's automatically labeled as being Italian. Okay. So that, that could be a bit of a, of a, of a chicken neck problem. Um, so. I don't know if really all square bucklers are Italian, but they're definitely all labeled as being Italian. Uh, but of course, we don't have any way to know whether that's true or not. Well, it's just the way Italian fashion started. It's, it, it, it has always been there. <laughs> exactly. And we know Italian fashion spread over Europe as well. And there were parts where the Italian fashion was, was very much on vogue. Yeah. So I guess the buckler was also made according to the fashion. So it, we would have probably English bucklers in the Italian fashion that are now being labeled as Italian. The next one is something I imagine uh, quite a lot of people might ask you because I saw it also in a new book, you uh, mind this uh, in, in various parts. Uh, it's that, as you said, Targa and, uh, and Buckler, those two types are very common in Northern Italy. And um, in our source text, we have, for example, if you look at Marozzo, we have different chapters for uh, the Targa and for the, for the Buckler. You decided to, to treat them from a uh, um, tap typology point of view as the same thing. So you label both as Bucklers. Could you walk us through the idea behind that or through your thoughts behind that? Uh, well, the idea of the buckler is, of course, twofold. It's the one is the morphological approach. So how does it look like what, what is the main characters in terms of size and then handling. And um, I decided that the uh, definition as being of 45 centimeter at most, uh, because if it's bigger, you can't really use it as a buckler and to have the single-handed grip on the back in whichever form and fashion. And then of course, 
if we, the second part would be how is a buckler used? So uh, every man-made object can be determined by, by its usage or by its intended usage. And the same is with the buckler. So if you look at how a buckler was used at the time, you can see, okay, this object would be used more like a buckler or more like a shield. Yep. And this is one of the two of the arguments to use as a target. And if I remember correctly, I'm not an expert on Maroso and Degrassi, uh, you are, but I think they were using them interchangeably as well, because uh, I think Degrassi declares it that the difference is only one in fashion. Uh, so somewhere in, in his treatise, he writes that the difference is in fashion only. And Maroso often mentions them together in the same sentence, where I say you use a buckler or shield, like whether it be round or square or whatever. So apparently they, they don't think that that's different in, in their usage. So I don't see a reason why the mm -hmm. target should not be a buckler. I would totally go with the target as a buckler. Now, from from Hima's point of view, it obviously um, you can argue about the fact to call them interchangeable, because I think that's uh, you could argue about that, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, you you have uh, special usages due to the, the to the form and and shape and and size. Um, but the same could be said for for a buckler of, of type one C, the the, the con, uh, convex one, uh, concave, sorry, uh, which is often described as being typically typically Welsh, which of course has a different type of usage. But yes. um, it's it's a bit like like the sword, which we tend to have different typologies on, and of course we use different swords differently depending on on length and, and grip length and so on and so forth. So I, I see there are similarities to the buckler as well. I think it's good to clarify that because um, I think some people, you know, if they just read the sentence interchangeable, they're going like, what? No, it's not the same. Me, 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 me. It's no, no, they're definitely <laughs> not the same. <laughs> I mean, there, there was a reason why they made a round one and a square one. They, they didn't mm -hmm. just do it out of, of yeah. you know, um, I don't like uh, round objects. Uh, of course, <laughs> there, there is a reason behind that. And of course, you might use them differently. But given the fact that they both existed simultaneously, side by side, at the same area, at the same time, and are shown in the same treatises, uh, I think Degrassi puts them side to side or, or have them one part of the round one and one part of the square one. Um, so obviously they, they weren't seen as two completely different types of, of weapons. So I think it's it's fair to assume, to subsumize them under the, the term buckler. I totally agree on that, yeah. Now you have been in touch with our club, Fior de la Spada, I think from the very beginning, mm -hmm. because uh, you were there when we were founded. And yeah. uh, I remember that Alex, our main coach, told me that he already fought uh, fought against you a bunch of times with I him using the Bologna yes. system, obviously, and you mm -hmm. using uh, 133. Now, do you remember that? And what oh, were your yeah. impressions? Yes, uh, I remember it vividly. It was quite a learning curve for, for me, to be honest. I mean, ultimately, with these questions, with comparing different systems and so on, basically, it's who is the better fighter. I mean, the better fighter will almost always win regardless of, of system used. Um, but given well, that both are, are equally uh, good, I think the, the problem is that 133 is fighting a bit closer in, in terms of distance. Mm -hmm. So you want to get closer to your opponent so you can manipulate the weapons. Whereas the, the Italian style tends to keep the, the opponent uh, at a distance and, and work from there. So as soon as the 133 guys try to rush in, of course, he's doing the, the Italian guy a, fa a favor and he will get beaten. Um, so generally speaking. And if the Italian guy keeps a distance and there is not much he, he risks. So basically, I think it depends on how the 133 fighter acts and reacts. So if he can be calm enough and patient enough to keep his distance and wait for the other guy to, to close the distance, as he will have to do at one point or another, then I think it might be very interesting. If the 133 fighter gets impatient and wants to, to use his techniques and closes, he will find himself in, in a lot of trouble and in a very difficult spot. Okay. Unfortunately, back then I was very impatient. <laughs> So yeah, I, I would fight differently today, and we definitely have to repeat this to, to see uh, what will be the outcome if I'm much more patient and, and keep my distance. We could do that soon. You're at Drain event next year, are you? 
Exactly my thoughts, yeah. Wow, what, <laughs> Definitely a, will so what, we, what a coincidence. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so let's do this, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. I mean, I don't have that much experience fighting with people of other styles. I think I, I had at least two 133 fighters at the Drain event mm -hmm. a few years ago. Generally, everybody who does German sources, my, my personal impression is that they love the bind that much. And I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> they want to go into the bind and I try to avoid it at any cost, mm -hmm. which is, was uh, kind of also an eye opener for me to, to realize that, um, people really try to work actively into a bind and to do something with it. And I, I don't want to do that at all. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think there is a, my, my few points changed a bit there because, uh, originally I had the view that the 133 system, especially is a system that works from the bind. Um, I don't think that anymore. Uh, I think the 133 system is a system that teaches you how to leave the bind. Mm -hmm. So you find yourself in a binding situation and then the system tells you what to do to get out of the bind in a positive way, positive for you, of course. Um, so that's interesting, especially when compared to the uh, North Italian styles, which is completely devoid of bind, or at least it's not uh, putting its emphasis on the bind, yeah. uh, where will this lead us? So if we don't have a bind to work from, uh, we have to completely re redo our, our approach. So it will all play pretty much into the hands of the Marossa and Tigrassi style, uh, and we'll put a lot of pressure on the 133 style, I guess. Differently with uh, Lignitsa, but I don't think Lignitsa was ever designed to be used against uh, a seasoned fighter. I think Lignitsa is a system that is to be used against uh, a novice fighter, some, someone who is not very good at sword and buckler. Every every advanced fighting style like Marossa, De Grassi, uh, uh, Lutka 133 and so on and so forth, uh, you, don't, you don't rely on your instinct. You overcome your instinct and you fight artfully. And Lignitzer uh, pretty much always relies on the instinct of the opponent. So uh, he's, not, he's not calculating with, with a well-trained fighter because a well-trained fighter doesn't rely on instinct. So regardless whether he would fight against a 133 fighter or a Marosso or a Degrassi fighter, uh, it would never work. It, uh, the techniques just don't work. But yeah, let's, let's look forward to the comments. My next question was when and why did the sun go down on the buckler? And I mean, I got to say, when I looked for your book yesterday, came across the picture with um, with a buckler and I say, this this doesn't look old. What, what is this? And I, I look down into the description, I see police buckler. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and, then, and then the next thought was, this looks, this, I don't know why, but the next thought that came to my mind was, this looks so British. And then I continue, <laughs> continue to read and I see it's a British police department. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, developed by Steve Tappin, and uh, I think it's it's a brilliant uh, explanation, a brilliant instance that the old techniques and the old ideas are still working because they were sound, they were tested over centuries, and if you enter the same situational uh, scenery in the sense of you, know, you have lots of people, um, you have uh, bladed instruments, you have thrown the instruments, you have blunt instruments, uh, a buckler is really, really a, a tool that that is good to have. Uh, so yes, there are modern police bucklers. Um, in, in as far as I know, there are some versions in Asia as well, which are rattan made or stuff like that. Uh, so they're definitely still in use, uh, and they, of course, they they definitely still work. I mean, why wouldn't they? I think the buckler went a bit out of use, you know, after uh, invention and, and widespread use of firearms and so on and so forth. Uh, but there were still pockets that, that the buckler survived. I mean, uh, the uh, Kefsureti in, in Georgia, they, they were still using the sword and buckler, or at least up to the 20th century. And they have a, a very strong tradition of sword and buckler fighting. Uh, it's also in the book, there is a whole chapter on there. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Uh, but in, in Central Europe, the, the sun went down on the buckler, I think at the end of the 16th century. Mm, okay, so right. After that, it, it would have been rather mm. uh, a quaint thing to have or, or a very, very old thing to have. So a buckler in the 17th century would probably have been seen as, as quite old-fashioned or, or ancient. 
I know there are some rapier sources that have uh, still include the buckler, but I have no idea when. Are you absolutely right? But I think that the old rapier sources showing buckler is it was more a continuation of of tradition. Mm. Something if you train the, the rapier, you also have to train rapier and dagger, rapier yeah. and, and cloak, and rapier and buckler. Uh, yeah. Although it it wasn't worn or in use anymore, so I would definitely say in the 17th century the buckler. Um, was in in strong decline or stark decline during all this time and this years of your research um what is your all-time favorite buckler do you have one? <laughs> that's difficult usually your favorite buckler is the one you're just working with so whenever i am at the museum and i have the original in hand that's my favorite buckler um of course that's a fascination of the object uh, in the moment Looking back on, on, on all the, the, the many, many bucklers I, I had the pleasure to, to handle, a few stand out, a few stand out because they were especially uh, brilliant or flashy or had some, some things that no other buckler uh, had. But for personal use, um, I think there are three bucklers that stand out. One is a very small one, a German one uh, at the moment in the Royal Armouries in Germany. Uh, so it's it it really just covering the fist and it has a pointed boss, uh, quite wicked. And the other one is a very famous one from the Museum of London. Uh, in the original, it's half encrusted. It's a river find that they cleaned half of it. And the other half is still encrusted because it was too fragile to, to clean up all of it. Um, and I had a, a reproduction made from this one. It's the reproduction I use every day in training. Uh, I really like this. But I think the favorite buckler um, of all is one that is dated in the 13th century and it was roughly 26 centimeters in diameter. Um, unfortunately, there are only fragments now. Uh, so you, you could make out how the buckler would have been, would have looked like in the original state. Uh, it had a wooden core with, with metal elements and metal covering. Um, it's in the in the storage room of the Museum of London, so it's not not for for view and not on view, unfortunately. Um, but this is a is a most striking and the most elegant butler, and I think that would be my butler of choice. If, if you okay. ask me, which would be my favorite, it's still there in fragments, uh, 13th century and rather small, but that that would be my favorite. Of course, all of these butlers are in the book. And have you already ordered a replica? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm looking forward. To, I'm looking for for a, a, an armorer to make a replica, but so far I couldn't decide which one. Um, so I'm, I'm in contact with a few people and, and shopping around, so to say, to see who would be able and up to make it for a price I can afford. The day you have it in your hand, I, I want a photograph, please. Oh, please. by all means, definitely <laughs> would be much better. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really curious to take a deeper look into your book. And yes. uh, uh, you might you might have noticed there are two books out. One is the, the book, the, the Medieval and Renaissance Buckler, um, which covers every aspect of the buckler, so from history to, to typology to how to wear and the construction and so on. And another is basically just the catalogue um, for those people who are only interested in the measurements and the photographs of the originals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much shorter and a lot cheaper, of course, as well. Uh, so people have the, the choice to go for only the, the catalog of the of the originals or for the full information of the buckler mm -hmm. in this period. Yeah, that's awesome because uh, Christmas is coming. And yeah. I mean, there are quite a few Himas that are bookworms and have a buckler at home. And this, I think, would make the perfect present for them. So. Oh, I agree. I agree. Totally. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for... Uh, yeah, that you uh, took the time to answer my questions. And it was my pleasure and my honor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, already looking forward to your next book. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So do I. <laughs> Curious <laughs> what it's going to be. Okay. Well, does that mean there's one in the pipeline? Uh, there are a few thoughts about books. Yes, yes. But uh, it's a bit early to talk about them in detail. Thank you. And see you at the train event. Thank you. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, nice. Okay, bye. Bye.